thank you. Good morning. Uh, let me begin by congratulating the uh, CIITC Center for uh, achieving this milestone. It's uh, 10 years of uh, existence, 10 years of, of uh, contributions, and 10 years of uh, shaping uh, the national debate on uh, sustainability. Uh, I've been involved, uh, had the privilege of being involved with the center in various capacities, uh, mostly uh, as a member of the jury for the Sustainability Award for uh, several years now, and uh, most recently as a member of the Advisory Council. And uh, I've seen how uh, over these years uh, the concept of sustainability has been uh, has become more widespread and also become more fleshed out uh, as uh, an integral part of uh, a business strategy. Uh, it's a very important space that the center and its peers uh, occupy. Uh, we have often been caught, I think, in uh, a sort of false dilemma between uh, growth or development and uh, environmental protection uh, and uh, the dilemma is you can have one or the other but not both. Uh, that leaves us nowhere. Uh, if you're forced to make uh, a choice uh, which has either way adverse consequences, uh, it leaves us no better off. Uh, the whole sustainability movement globally and of course in our own context uh, I think has really been an attempt to resolve this dilemma to try and find ways in which the trade-off can be converted into a complementarity that both objectives can be achieved uh, simultaneously. It requires uh, behavioral changes, it requires strategic changes, it requires uh, organizational changes, but uh, ultimately it is within those domains that this trade-off can be converted into uh, a complementarity. And uh, that is, I think, the way in which the uh, mission or the, the activities of the center uh, have contributed to this uh, whole process. Uh, I was asked by the organizers to share my thoughts on the next decade since we've already completed one. Uh, what, what does the sustainability agenda look like for the next, or what should it look like for the next decade? Uh, I think there is both uh, a significant element of continuity, uh, but also a potential breaking point in this process. So let me lay out uh, the foundations, summarize what the achievements of the last decade have been, and then use that as a platform to talk about what next. Uh, we just saw the release of the ITC uh, sustain sustainability report, and I think that, in a sense, reflects one pillar of what has come to be become a very uh, robust foundation for uh, business practices relating to sustainability. Uh, we go back about in the last 10 to 15 years uh, to see the emergence of four pillars of this. Uh, there is the Global Compact, the UN Global Compact, which essentially is a code of conduct, a set of behaviors, a set of uh, practices that companies undertake to uh, contribute to uh, sustainability, uh, aligning business activities, business processes, uh, and the use of resources, uh, treatment and engagement with communities, and of course environmental uh, conservation. Uh, a commitment to align, a commitment to behave in ways which are conducive to sustainability. Uh, so that is linking or, or locking corporates in through, through voluntary commitment. I think the important principle here is that this is all uh, voluntary, it's not, it's not mandated, and I don't think you can have sustainability coming from an entirely or predominantly mandated framework. It has to be voluntary. People have to believe uh, that this is a worthwhile cause and a worthwhile endeavor. 
the second pillar is the what this report ref reflects the uh, global reporting initiative uh, to be sustainable uh, not only you have to, not only do you have to do things in a certain way but you have to hold yourself and make yourself accountable to the larger community and uh, the best way to do that is through complete transparency uh, disclosing whatever you did in terms of achievements in terms of failures what you intend to do, how you intend to do it, uh, what sort of policy framework do you have within the organization to achieve these objectives. All of these allow stakeholders to judge the credibility and the seriousness of the commitment uh, of the organization to this uh, cause. And uh, therefore it is, I think, a fundamental uh, contribution or a fundamental building block of uh, sustainability that is disclosure, transparency and disclosure. The third uh, links it directly to finance, the third and the fourth both actually link uh, the process directly to finance. Uh, we have the PRI, the Principles of Responsible Investment, which uh, requires or involves commitments by investors, people who manage money, uh, to investing into companies that uh, basically practice the uh, behaviors that the UN Global Compact suggests. So there is a great overlap between all of these uh, agendas and all of these pillars. Uh, uh, the PRI uh, incentivizes compliance, incentivizes uh, uh, commitments to sustainability by companies because it directs and uh, influences the investment decisions of outside of external fund managers. Uh, and the fourth, also financially related, is the equator, so-called equator principles, which uh, apply to banks. Banks uh, are, who sign on to it are committing to make their lending decisions uh, based on the sustainability practices of their borrowers. So these are, I think, together, uh, a very effective, in theory, framework that involves voluntary compliance, voluntary commitments uh, by all of the stakeholders in the broad uh, area of business, whether it is companies or finance or, or investors, uh, to uh, behave in, uh, to organize their businesses, to carry out their businesses, uh, their business practices in a particular way. Now, from the Indian perspective, this is uh, a growing movement. Uh, the number of companies that have signed on to all of these are relatively small uh, in the tens perhaps uh, 80, 90, thereabouts global compact and the uh, global reporting initiative. Uh, the global quantum of funds managed by uh, managed under PRI uh, uh, conditionalities is relatively small maybe a percent or two of the total investment uh, but uh, it's work in progress and uh, I think the, the only way to go is up. Now if I am to characterize this whole decade, the emergence of, the, of a holistic concept of sustainability, the establishment of various pillars that concretize it, that uh, uh, turn it into very specific uh, practices uh, and behaviors. Uh, and as we've seen the emergence of centers of, of bodies like the Center of Excellence, uh, this I would say it reflects uh, a process of making business sustainable. And I think that would be the sort of the essential characterization of the experience of the last decade. Uh, this is going to continue because as I said in India or even globally, uh, the spread is, the penetration is relatively small, there's, there's, there's enormous space for these commitments to, to expand and as businesses see the benefits concretely in terms of the triple bottom line that uh, Mr. Devish were referred to, uh, they will have greater incentives to, uh, to sign on. Uh, and as I said, this, is, this movement is only going to succeed if it is largely voluntary in nature. People, companies have to believe that it is in their benefit to sign on. Uh, the next decade, I think, that, uh, suggests also an opportunity for transition, for change. 
and I would characterize that as making sustainability a business. I think that that is a significant change in paradigm, uh, where we begin to see uh, the emergence of a variety of technologies, of services, of products, uh, which are economically viable, which are commercially viable, which can make money for their producers, but in doing so are actually contributing directly to the sustainability agenda. Now, you know, this is uh, a little uh, perhaps difficult to visualize, uh, but I think that's the way we have to think of long-term uh, scenarios, that is, look at what is difficult to visualize and try and flesh it out and try and give it substance and concreteness. Uh, but just to, to draw on a few examples, uh, we were uh, last week uh, in a jury meeting of the sustainability, sustainability Awards and we noticed that a number of first-time applicants, uh, companies these are obviously corporate entities of some size, uh, in the waste management business. Now, this was a completely new uh, area. We have not seen these companies entering this space before. Uh, we, uh, I'm sure everybody is aware of waste management activity going on somewhere in some form. But I think the association we make with this activity is informal sector, uh, you know, kids picking plastic out of uh, landfill sites and so on. Not a, not a very edifying picture. But here we are starting to see uh, the emergence of corporate entities who are starting to do this. I think that's, a, that's an extremely uh, positive sign. Uh, we, uh, I think, are, are nowhere near realizing the full uh, potential of this business given the amount of waste that we generate. Uh, much of our consumption activity is, uh, is getting waste intensive. Uh, I just give you two examples. I, I know Mr. Deveshwar is, is a champion of, of packaged food. But uh, if you get food delivered home, uh, the amount of packing material far exceeds the, uh, the weight of the food often. Uh, if you order goods from an e-commerce website, uh, the volume of the package is about four or five times the, uh, the volume of the product. Uh, this is necessary, I presume, to preserve the value, but at the same time it creates enormous challenges for waste disposal. Uh, much of it is recyclable, of course, it's cardboard and plastic and so on. But in the absence of an effective recycling framework, recycling mechanism, which I don't think we have on a, uh, sort of on a widespread basis, uh, much of it goes into landfill, much of it does not get picked up and uh, simply adds to the overall environmental problem. So if you're starting to see technologies that are being able to exploit this, uh, by bringing costs down uh, and also by increasing the efficiency of recycling, what are the kind of uses that you can put this, uh, this material to, uh, that is going to be a huge benefit to, uh, to, uh, to the sustainability movement. Uh, we are seeing, for example, the emergence of uh, waste to energy plants, uh, power plants set up uh, close to landfills. Uh, there are transportation issues which make them economical only if they are located close to landfills because transporting uh, the fuel is, is, uh, is, is expensive. Uh, but perhaps there are ways of compression, there are ways of bricketing or, or, or uh, packaging or processing the waste into, uh, into forms, physical forms that are easier to transport, perhaps can, perhaps can be mixed into uh, other fuels, all of which then increases the overall the life cycle uh, utility, as the minister was saying, of uh, specific products. It can be used as many times uh, uh, over and over again as possible. Uh, E-waste is a huge, huge problem. Uh, electronic gadgets are becoming obsolete faster and faster. Uh, there is hardly ever, uh, or increasingly so, uh, less and less of a, a used, a second-hand or resale market for many of them, uh, and they're just discarded. Uh, how do we process these? Are there technologies that uh, we can find that makes better use of this, stripping out whatever uh, rare earth metals there are and so on? Uh, all of these, I think, are opportunities for businesses to emerge 
in ways that contribute to sustainability and yet are uh, economically viable. Now, in order to facilitate this, all of the stakeholders uh, that I referred to in the first decade also have a role. Uh, yes, innovation is, is key to this, and the minister emphasized uh, the need for R&D. Uh, but innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. Innovation doesn't happen uh, in a situation where people are not geared towards it, not encouraged to do it uh, from day one. Uh, you can't take uh, people who are trained in a particular way and oriented in a particular way uh, for 20 years or 25 years and then expect them to become innovators overnight. Uh, innovation begins at, at, the very, uh, at very early stages in life, I think. Uh, the whole process of schooling, the whole process of education itself has to be geared towards innovation uh, before it can translate or fructify in, uh, in college or uh, you know, in early working life, which is looking at the people that are constantly mentioned, whether it's Steve Jobs or, or uh, Larry Page or uh, Sergey Brin or Zuckerberg, and they all started their the core innovations were in their uh, early 20s. Uh, you know, that, that, there's something to be uh, learned from that. I think there's some, something to be generalized from that. Uh, what, is, what should the government do? The government will, of course, have instruments uh, or, or incentives that can provide to these technologies. But I think more than uh, fiscal incentives, uh, it's important to just for people to know what's going on. Uh, I, I haven't, uh, you know, yet seen, and I'm not talking only about uh, about uh, these kinds of technologies here. I've I've been working in in energy, uh, in education and health uh, as well over the last few months. And I find uh, it very striking that there simply isn't an adequate archive of uh, knowledge, of information, or the hundreds and thousands of experiments that people are trying with all kinds of uh, delivery mechanisms. Very small scale, many of them work for a few months and then break down. But unless we aggregate this, unless we know what's going on at the uh, at the bottom, at the grassroots, uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to identify what is a successful or potentially successful model and what is not. And I think the need to put together some sort of a living or live uh, archive, uh, a database of what's going on is very important. This is something I think only it's a public good, uh, only the government can do it. Uh, and that's an important role I think the government needs to play. Uh, as far as business is concerned, it's a matter of scaling up, mentoring, facilitation, all kinds of things that take a potentially viable investment in a technology and innovation uh, to actual uh, viability, to scale, and to spread, and to penetration, which uh, I think only large organizations can do. I mean, we again, we, we, we keep referring to the same old uh, names extreme examples of, of great success starting from a garage or a, or a study and translating into a, you know several billion dollars worth of business. But we ought to remember that these are the exceptions and these are the survivors, very, very small percentage of, uh, of hundreds of thousands of people who tried the same things but didn't really succeed. And one reason why they didn't succeed may be the idea of, uh, of transformation. Uh, so let me just uh, conclude here uh, by re-emphasizing the need to balance the continuity, the building up, the reinforcement of the foundations of the movement uh, over the last decade, uh, to combine that with the need to break out uh, of uh, the mold and to bring to life uh, business models that exploit technologies that are directly addressing uh, the objective of sustainability. Uh, so to the three bottom lines that we're used to thinking about, maybe we should add a fourth one, uh, call it whatever, call it innovation, call it knowledge, but I think it, it is as important a component of this, uh, this idea, this concept uh, as the other three. Thank you very much for listening.